Next speaker is uh, Tim uh, Barks from uh, uh, Google. He's a software engineer there, and he's going to talk about implementing open APIs uh, and GraphQL services uh, with uh, gRPC. Uh, so Tim, you have the, the stage. Uh, I'll be back uh, for the Q&A session. OK, great. Thank you. I'm hoping you can hear me. You can let me know if there's a problem. Um, so I'm presenting my screen, um, and I'm, uh, as Vlad mentioned, I'm a software developer at Google, and I love API systems um, because API systems make APIs easier to use, and that means we can use more APIs. Uh, today I'm going to talk about three API systems, um, OpenAPI, GraphQL, and gRPC. Um, and I'm going to suggest that the best way to build robust implementations of all of these systems is to use gRPC. <clears throat> so stepping back, we could think about aspects of API systems by looking at these five questions about these systems. What problem is it addressing? Sorry, Tim. Yes. Uh, we don't see your presentation. Hmm. Can just check. You have to click right on the right of your microphone to right, share. Perfect. Better? Okay, let me do it. Good luck. Okay, so um, just looking back, I'm going to talk about API technologies, why implement your API with gRPC, and then how we can build Open API and GraphQL with gRPC. So looking at API systems, we'll look at these five questions. And let's just start talking about these systems. Um, and I think what we'll see, what, what I believe, is that each of these addresses a very different problem. And they fit well together. So Open API is a specification for describing RESTful web services. And um, RESTful web services, as you know, are very easy to call from, say, a web browser or from curl. They have probably the easiest um, onboarding time of any of the API systems um, that we might have, or certainly of the ones that we're talking about today. Um, and so people can very easily sit down with a web browser and start calling a REST API. Um, there's also a number of tools for generating code um, for calling REST APIs, because eventually we're going to build software that makes these calls, and we, and we need code to do that. Um, open API services, how are they built? Um, often they're built with just code. People write code to implement their API, and then somehow they extract an API description. Now, there's another approach, which is to start with an API spec. Um, people generate code for their API services from open API specifications. Um, and so they handwrite their API descriptions, generate their implementations from that, and in some ways get more robust um, and even simpler API servers. But that's not the norm for REST services in OpenAPI. That's something that some people do, but not everyone. Um, so what's great about OpenAPI is that standards and tools make it easy to get started. And it's very popular. So you have a lot of support for using OpenAPI. Um, but what's challenging is that there's a lot of different ways to make REST APIs and a lot of different interpretations of what REST means. And that means that the transition from calling an API by hand in a browser to using code to call that API can sometimes be a little bit rough. Um, there's lots of code generators for open API, but they don't always work with every open API spec, or they don't always work well with that. So there's a lot of variability there, and some some rough spots in the transition to code when you're calling an open API based application. Um, but things are getting better quickly with that. Um, if we look at GraphQL, GraphQL is mainly a query language for APIs. It's not so much about the API, um, the protocol for calling the API over the network. It's the language used to specify an API query and to get results back and to elaborate on that. Um, you call an API just with a post. There's not really much to it. Um, and even that is um, sort of arbitrary. There's different ways to call a GraphQL API. But uh, I mean, 
it's really just a matter of parsing the query. Um, and post happens to be the easiest way to pass that along. Um, GraphQL services are built often with code first and schemas extracted from code. Um, but there's some work to um, compile schemas in a schema definition language that produces a scaffolding that you can use to produce your GraphQL server. Um, and you can also generate a GraphQL service by federating together GraphQL APIs from other providers or other ones that you have and bridges from open API to GraphQL. And then a tool called Rejoiner that I'll talk about later that um, builds a GraphQL surface from a gRPC API or a set of gRPC APIs. So what's great is that the client side interface is very simple. You just write queries. Um, it's very rich in the query language to optimize for performance of the clients. So clients can ask for just what they want. Um, it's still layered on HTTP. Um, and you can essentially make a backend for front end for your application that can grow and evolve and maybe be shared with other apps because that thing you need for the backend for your app can be expressed in the GraphQL language. And with some variation to the GraphQL query, that might be the backend for a different front end. Um, but this comes with some complexity in building the server. Sometimes GraphQL queries can be expensive to fulfill. Um, it's less clear how you make versions of a GraphQL API. It's sort of set up to be something you dynamically query. So when you do change your versions and schemas, um, you need a pattern for that. And, and that's not so um, formal. And as a result, we find that GraphQL APIs are most often used inside organizations and less often made public for, say, third party developers to use. So next, gRPC. gRPC is a modern, open source, high performance RPC framework. Um, gRPC is about making function calls over a network in a large distributed system. And it um, works very well for connecting systems together. Um, it's always called with a specification first. And um, it's also always generated from a specification first. Um, the services are always built with um, a protocol buffer description of the API first and code generators that build scaffolding and then developers just fill in that scaffolding. And the reason for that um, is to re really reduce the amount of code used to build your API systems. And this is just a picture of a ACM article from um, some people at Google about the amount of code at Google and um, gRPC evolved from Google's internal systems for building APIs that were very largely driven by the desire to write less code around APIs. So gRPC um, lets you build lots of features with, with less code. Um, so there's a lot built into it. It's got high performance. Um, we'll mention that it uh, works across languages and um, can you can have very nice client libraries for gRPC, um, but you have to get some learning and tooling uh, to make this work. So why would you implement an open API or GraphQL service with gRPC? Um, the one big reason is that whenever you implement software, you wind up decomposing it into functions and procedures that you call. And um, gRPC is procedures and functions that you can call just over a network in a distributed way. So as you're building your open API service or your GraphQL service, you're going to write functions to implement that. And why not make those functions um, distributed over a network so you can build a large, robust system? And why not make those functions be um, accessible or able to be written in any of a bunch of different languages? Why bind yourself to just one implementation languages? So in gRPC, APIs have a language, and it's not C or um, Go or C sharp or it's or Java, it's protocol buffers. The protocol buffer language is a way of describing APIs um, interface first. You describe the messages of your API, and then you describe the RPCs that pass those messages back and forth. Um, protocol buffers is um, open source. 
Uh, it's implemented and published by Google for a variety of languages. And then other companies uh, like Apple here on the right have implemented protocol buffer support for languages they prefer, like Swift. Um, protocol buffers is a little bit confusing because it means several different things. It's a serialization message mechanism, a uh, way of describing interfaces in a methodology. Um, protocol buffer messages are just streams of bytes. And you can come back to this and look, this is the encoding of the word hello um, in protocol buffers. And this was designed at Google to have more efficient internal communication between services. Um, there's an interface description language that describes messages and a compiler called Proto-C that compiles those descriptions and then calls plugins that generate code to support the, um, the messages and communication in, in whichever language you prefer. And interestingly, this plugin is um, called from a C++ program. The plugin is written in Go and generates Go code. And it's a very common pattern for the plugins to be written in the languages that they generate, which allows the language experts to generate the code that they need. And so with this, gRPC scales to lots of different programming languages. We can have systems that are built in combinations of Java, Python, Go, C++, and other languages. There's um, tens of languages supported by Google. Actually, there's Dart also on this list, supported by part of Google that's not on the core gRPC team, and several others outside of that. And really, everything that Google makes is built um, in software as a distributed system using gRPC or Stubby, the product predecessor of gRPC. So all of our apps, all search, Gmail, really everything is a large distributed system where all the functions behind that are gRPC. And that includes REST APIs and GraphQL APIs that Google is making. Um, gRPC is open source. And we have um, a style guide for gRPC that kind of strictly describes how IP APIs should be made. And so for example, something like pagination has many different ways that people might implement pagination. Um, but with these API improvement proposals, we've proposed a single way to do pagination that all of our APIs support. And that has some advantages in building client code. Um, a team that I worked on produces generated API clients based on gRPC. So gRPC already provides some code generation. Um, this adds an extra level of generation of code on top of that to make APIs a little bit easier to use. Um, for example, even with generated gRPC code, there's some glue code that you usually need to set up your connection. And with these GAPIX, these generated API clients, we've been able to reduce that to a single line for, you know, you import this package, create a login client, and you've got your connection made and configured to be making logging API calls. Um, there's lots of other examples of this in slides that I'm going to skip that are in the notes. Um, but one worth showing is pagination, again, that I mentioned. Um, with pagination following our AIP guidelines, we have a standard way of getting tokens and using those tokens. And if every API uses that, then we can produce iterators that are based on that that make it very easy to iterate over collections. Um, our GAPIC generators are written in a bunch of different languages, just like the, uh, the plugins used for protocol buffers. And um, there are some that we support and others that we're encouraging people outside of the Google team to develop. Um, another thing that we've done is built a command line interface generator for gRPC APIs. So any of those functions described in the protocol buffer interface definition can be called at the command line uh, so that you can very quickly interact with an API that you're building. Um, there's reflection support, support for using gRPC in browsers, and gRPC works with API management, including some products from Google. So I want to move ahead to looking at open API and REST services with gRPC. It turns out that Google publishes lots of REST APIs, and they're all built with gRPC. They're all built by taking a gRPC API that's described in protocol buffers and adding annotations to it that are described in this AIP 127 on um, HTTP and gRPC transcoding. Um, and these annotations are added to the protocol buffer descriptions. And they specify things like the, um, the URL path 
used to invoke an API. And in some cases, they show how you map from here. This is an ID that's a, a part of the path that maps to an ID field in a message that's described elsewhere that the software is able in the compiler to figure out the mapping between this path segment and the field in the protocol buffer message and automatically convert an HTTP request into a gRPC call on the back end. So with, with no handwritten glue code, we can offer REST APIs um, that have gRPC behind them. And with all of the features of gRPC, like from the software perspective. Um, this is an example showing that. And over the summer of 2019, we worked with a Summer of Code student, Lorenz Hoffman Wellenhoff, who built a tool called Gnostic gRPC. Gnostic is an open API compiler, and Gnostic gRPC takes a compiled open API specification and attempts to generate a gRPC service that would implement that API, that open API spec. So it's kind of the reverse of the annotations that I just showed you. This is saying for a given API, um, what's the gRPC service that would produce that? And these are links to his blog posts and um, run-throughs of, of this work. So finally, if we look at GraphQL services, it's kind of similar. Um, that you could think about how to map a GraphQL service to gRPC automatically. But as you look at the GraphQL community, um, there's kind of a debate about whether you generate your GraphQL. For one thing, do you go code first or schema first? And do you derive your GraphQL API from your data? Or do you build your, your GraphQL API to serve the applications that your users need? So. The approach that we've shown that Google is using and others are using to go um, to do this HTTP transcoding, um, that's kind of a, a data first. That's taking the API and publishing the gRPC API outward. Here, we might want to go the other way and take a GraphQL API and figure out how to implement it with gRPC. And it turns out the complexity of these GraphQL APIs means that we still might need to hand, like do some hands design of the backend APIs. But we still might implement those backend systems in gRPC. Now, there's a team at Google, there's several teams at Google that are building GraphQL APIs. And some of them are using a tool called Rejoiner. Rejoiner is a, um, it's a open source project. Um, it's written in Java. And it binds together gRPC services, reading the protocol buffers, and produces a GraphQL API. Um, there's an example of this in this medallion project that's linked here that you can see on GitHub. And here you can see um, a GraphQL query that's being made to a gRPC service. And if you click through on this events link, you'll see the protos for the events message in gRPC. And you can see that um, Rejoiner is stitching together messages in protocol buffers to form this GraphQL service. Now, that may be too um, structured and prescriptive for a complex GraphQL API because that could lead to lots of gRPC calls. So we may just want to start directly with the GraphQL library and implement functions to provide this, the data that we need for that. And for that, I've been experimenting and others with hand wrapping um, gRPC services to provide GraphQL. And here's a small project that uses the GraphQL Go library to um, provide a, GR, a GraphQL API that's calling gRPC behind that. Uh, so, and given the time, you can look into that. Here's some examples of um, graphical queries that are backed with gRPC. Um, so looking at this, there's, there's lots of information about APIs in all three of these systems. They have formal schema definition languages. Um, we can find ways to bind one API description format to another. Um, in some cases, we can automatically generate descriptions from the other, like we can generate a GraphQL interface from a gRPC service. 
And then there's some gaps in places where we, we don't have all the tools we need, where, you know, here in this community, we may find people who want to work on these things. But I would just say in conclusion, each of these three API systems make APIs easier to use. And um, our feeling and, and my feeling is that gRPC solves the problem of building um, procedural code in distributed ways that you need to implement all three of these kinds of service. Um, and gRPC has a lot of community support. It's how Google builds nearly all of its APIs, our APIs, and gRPC is public and open so that you and others can use it too. And um, that's all I have. I'm happy to take questions or follow up in chat. Thanks. Thank you for an entertaining presentation. So it, you went through quite a lot of topics in a short time. Uh, I had some uh, questions that I wanted to ask, but uh, you already you already answered them. But uh, let me because you, you cover such a uh, let's say wide range of API files and technology that implemented. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, if, you, if you have been in the industry for a long time, they kind of came up out naturally. But let me, like, probably you are aware about all these means about uh, what it takes to be a web developer in 2020. Yeah, like, uh, and this is more about, uh, the question is more about the front end. But uh, I think the question is valid also for the back end, right? Because there are so many layers of abstraction uh, so much tooling, so much code generation. So, uh, what what are your views in this area? Um, how to be successful as a backend developer or a web developer? Or how 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 do you start? Like, uh, uh, how do you how uh, how can you uh, grasp all this uh, complexity of? The technologies that you are using, because the, the the tooling is in a way simple. It is. There are a lot of pieces. Um, I would um, learn Go as as one thing, because a lot of this tooling is written in Go, and um, just as important as JavaScript is on the front end. I think um, Go is very important on the back end for. Um, especially for distributed API systems. Um, I mean, you can certainly build your backend with Node or with Ruby, um, but these are kinds of systems that are usually simpler. Um, Java and Go are used to build kind of the bigger systems. Um, but I would, you know, learn some programming languages for the backend and um, samples on GitHub are a great way to, to learn about things and also spend time focusing on the interface definitions. Um, so learning about open API and how to work with open API descriptions and um, protocol buffers, I think both have a lot of leverage. 